Let's start with a big picture. What is nuclear fusion? And maybe what is nuclear fission? Uh, let's lay out the basics. So fusion is what powers the universe. Fusion is what happens in stars, and it's where the vast amount of energy that even that we use today here on Earth comes from the process of fusion. It also is what powers plants, and those plants become oil, and those become fossil fuels that then powers the rest of human civilization for the last hundred years. And so fusion really underpins a lot of what has enabled us as humans to go forward. However, ironically, we don't do it actively here on Earth to make electricity yet. And so fundamentally what fusion is, is taking the most common elements in the universe, hydrogen and lightweight isotopes of hydrogen and helium, and fusing those together to make heavier elements. In that process, as you combine atomic nuclei and form heavier nuclei, those nuclei are slightly lighter than the sum of the parts. And that comes from a lot of the details of quantum mechanics and how those fundamental particles combine and interact. Um, we also talk about the strong nuclear force that holds the atomic nucleuses together as one of the fundamental forces involved in fusion. But that mass defect, E equals mc squared, we know from Einstein, is also energy. And so in that process, a tremendous amount of energy is released. And the actual reactions, I think, is a lot more interesting than simply it's a little bit lighter and therefore energy is released. But that's the fundamental process in fusion is you're bringing those, those lightweight atomic nuclei, those isotopes together. Fission is the exact opposite, where you're taking the heaviest elements in the universe, uranium, plutonium, things that are so heavy and have so many internal protons and neutrons and electrons that they're barely held together at all. They're fundamentally unstable or radioactive. And those elements are very close to falling apart. And as they do that, if you take a uranium-235 or a plutonium-239 nucleus and you add something new, usually it's a neutron, a subatomic particle that's uncharged, that unstable, that very large nuclei will then break into pieces, many pieces, a whole spectrum of pieces. But if you add up all of those pieces, they also have slightly less mass than the initial one did, the initial uranium or plutonium. And in that process, again, e equals mc squared, a tremendous amount of energy is released. There's a very famous curve in atomic physics, fusion or fission, looking at the periodic table going from the lightest elements, hydrogen, to the heaviest elements, those uranium, plutonium, and others. And fusion happens up to iron. Iron is the magical point in between where lighter elements than iron fuse together and heavier elements fizz or uh, are fissile and break apart and release energy. I think about and I look at that process uh, in stars and that our star is fundamentally an early stage star that's burning just hydrogens. But when it burns and does fusion, those hydrogens combine into heliums, and later stage stars can then burn those heliums, and they can fuse those together to form even heavier elements and carbons, and those carbons can fuse together and form heavier elements. And um, that whole stellar process is something that inspires us uh, at Helion to think about what are fusion fuels, not just the simplest ones, but more advanced fusion fuels that we see in stars throughout the universe. Okay, so there's a million things I want to say. So first, maybe zooming out to the biggest possible picture. If we look across hundreds of millions, billions of years, and all the, my opinion, alien civilizations that are out there, they're going to be powered likely by fusion. So our advanced intelligent civilization is powered by fusion in that the sun is our power plant. Mm -hmm. uh, then the other thing is the physics. Again, very basic, but you said E, equals mc squared a couple times. Mm -hmm. Can you explain this equation? E equals mc squared is a fundamental relationship that a patent clerk, Einstein, discovered and unlocked an entire new realm of physics and engineering and has shown us atomic physics, what happens inside the nucleus, and unlocked our understanding of the universe and paved the way for many of the physics advancements that came after, that we think about mass as these particles. But in reality, also, at the same time, their energy. And there's a direct quantitative relationship between how much energy is in all of that mass. And in fact, all of the energy that is released 
even by uh, by atomic physics, sure, certainly in atomic reactions is equals mc squared. And that that I think most people are, have heard of and are use, used to, but also in chemistry and in chemical bonds, that in those chemical bonds, there is a change in mass. When you take a hydrogen and an oxygen and you burn them and you combine them into water, there's a change in mass. Now, that change per atom and per molecule is actually so small that it's extremely hard to measure, but but it's still there. And that's the energy that is released. And you can quantify that. We use uh, units of electron volts um, as a unit of what is the energy in atomic processes or chemical processes. Can you also just speak to the the different fuels that you mentioned, both on the fusion and the mm -hmm. fission side? So uranium, plutonium for the fission, and then hydrogen isotopes for the fusion. So for fission, uranium and plutonium, we don't make those nuclei. Those right now for humanity, those have been made in the primordial universe through super, supernova and Big Bang um, and the initial formation of the universe where matter was created. And so we dig those up. We dig up uranium, plutonium out of the ground. Um, and in fact, most plutonium we make from uranium. And we can talk about how to enrich uh, uranium if we, if we want to go down that road. But that's how we get those molecules and nuclei. For fusion materials, hydrogenetic species or hydrogens um, are primordial in the universe. Also, only the most common things that are in the universe. The sun, suns and stars are made up of hydrogens and heliums. Um, and so the vast majority of atoms in the universe still are hydrogen. So the basic fuel for fission is already in the ground. And then the basic fuel for fusion is everywhere is everywhere. And we particularly use a type of hydrogen called deuterium, which is a heavier isotope of hydrogen. Hydrogen is typically one proton and one electron, atomic mass of one. Deuterium is an atomic mass of two, which is a proton, which is a charged particle, and it has a neutron in its nucleus, which is an uncharged particle. And so that's deuterium as the fuel. Now, deuterium is also found in all water on Earth, in the water I'm drinking right now. It's in my body. It's in Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 everywhere. Um, and and safe and clean and and one of those fundamental particles that was born in the cosmos. And we estimate that in seawater here on Earth, we have if we powered at our current use of electricity, all of humanity on fusion somewhere between a hundred million years and a billion years of fuel in hydrogen and deuterium here on Earth. And how is that stored mostly? And mostly that's just in water. Mostly that it's a mix of, we, we call this actually heavy water, where you have normal water that you're used to. Uh, we talk about and you learn in school is H2O, where there's two hydrogens and oxygen in a nucleus in the molecule. And deuterium or heavy water is D2O, two deuteriums and an oxygen. Um, in reality, it's actually an interesting mix uh, where you have some HDO, so a mix of hydrogen and deuterium. You also have other hydrogenic species. Tritium is another one where you add a second neutron to that hydrogen, and then you can have T2O, tritiated water. Um, and that's something that that comes up and 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 we need to talk about at some point. Um, and there's other, as you go up the periodic table, you get add two protons and you get helium. And so helium, the most common helium is, is helium four, which is two protons and two neutrons. And then we use an isotope of helium. The nucleus is called the helion, which is what we base the company after, which is two protons and one neutron. It's a light helium molecule. So the number you mentioned in terms of uh, how much fuel is available, basically the, the takeaway there is it's a nearly endless resource in terms of fuel. Is that correct to say? That's correct to say at today's power level. I think what's interesting is the idea that as we deploy the same power source that powers the universe here on Earth as humans, can we do more? Can we have access to much more electricity and much more energy and do really interesting things with that? And still, there's large amounts, millions and millions of years of power, um, even at much higher output power levels for humanity. Yeah, so the moment we start running out of uh, <laughs> hydrogen and helium, where <laughs> that means we're doing some pretty incredible things with, with, with our technology. And then that technology is probably gonna allow us to propagate out into the universe and then discover other sources. Because you can also get it on other planets. Whatever planets yeah. have water, and it looks more and more likely like a lot of them do. What an incredible future. 
just out into the cosmos, nuclear power plants everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So uh, to linger on the some of the technical stuff, you said uh, strong nuclear force. So how exactly is the energy created? So how does the E equals MC squared, the, the M go to the E uh, in fusion? So in fusion, you take these lightweight isotopes like hydrogen and deuterium. And as you combine them and get and take these molecules and get them closer and closer together, some really interesting fundamental physics happens. So first, um, these atomic nuclei are charged. They have an electric charge and they like charges repel. And I think everybody is familiar with that, where you take two positive charges and you try to push them together and the electromagnetic force between them repels them. So you have a force that's actually pushing against them. So in fusion, you work to get your fuel very hot, very, very high temperatures, 100 million degree temperatures. And temperature really is kinetic energy. It's motion, it's velocity. So that these particles are moving so fast that even though they're coming together and there's this repulsive electromagnetic force, they can still come close enough that another force comes into play, which is the strong force. Um, and then once you get within a very close distance on the order of the scale of those nuclei themselves, of those atomic nuclei, so the tiniest thing you could imagine and probably way smaller than that, these particles then are attracted to each other and they combine and they fuse together. At that point, you create heavier atomic nuclei that have a slightly less mass, slightly less total mass in the system. And that mass equals mc squared as energy. So extremely high temperature, extremely high speed. Uh, maybe that's one of the other differences also with fusion and fission is just the amount of temperature required for the reactions. Is that accurate to say? Yeah, and I think fundamentally, it's that in a lot of ways, fusion is hard and fission is easy. Yeah. Nuclear fission happens at room temperature, that this uranium and plutonium is so likely to break apart already that simply the adding of one of these neutrons, one extra particle, will then break it apart and release energy. Um, and if you have a lot of them together, it will create a chain reaction. Fusion, that doesn't happen at all. Fusion is actually really hard to do. You have to overcome those electromagnetic forces to have a single fusion reaction happen. Um, and so it takes things like in our sun, we have what is called gravitational confinement, where the gravity, literally the mass of the fuel itself is pulling to the center of the sun and it's pulling in there. So there's a large force that's pulling all that fuel together and, and, and holding it and confining it together such that it gets close enough and hot enough for long enough that fusion happens. And then we have to figure out if we're uh, building fusion reactors, we have to figure out how to do that confinement without the huge uh, size gravity of the sun. That's right. Obviously, the sun is vastly larger than Earth, and so we can't do that same process here on Earth. Yet. No, I'm just kidding. Right. But we have other forces we get to use. We can use the electromagnetic force, which the sun doesn't get to do, to apply those forces. And I actually want to take a pause right there and point out a word. Historically, we've used the word reactor around fusion, but I don't think that's right. And for me, we're really careful about this terminology mm -hmm. um, when we look to how that word is defined and we can look to how the experts define it. It doesn't really apply to fusion. Um, so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, uh, defines reactor as I have it. I have it right here. A nuclear reactor is an apparatus other than an atomic weapon designed or used to sustain nuclear fission in a self-supporting chain reaction. And there's two big parts to that, that one, fission reaction, obviously fusion is not that, we've talked about why, but also the self-sustaining part, in that a reactor is self-sustaining, you take your hands off of it and it keeps going. In fusion, that doesn't happen. And, uh, and we know because we have to do it every day and it's really hard to do. And so we actually use the word generator because you, we don't talk about, for instance, a natural gas reactor is that if you stop putting in fuel, it turns off. And the same thing happens in fusion. And so we'll, we're, we're pretty careful about making sure we talk about that as a generator where you're putting in fuel, you're getting electricity out. Um, and then when you stop putting in fuel, it just shuts off. And you can go even one step further and say, what am I going to do with this fusion that powers the universe? And what does humanity want out of this? And what we want is electricity. We don't simply want 
a set of reactions um, or even heat and energy. That's great. But what I really want is electricity. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about the technical details of one of the big benefits of the linear design of the approach that you do is you get to electricity directly as quickly as possible. And some of the other alternatives um, have a intermediate step. And those are, again, are our, our technical details.